but welcome to the last in this series of Great Wonders lectures. Um, difficult topic, the Great Wall, or as I've called them, the Great Walls. If you compare them to all of the other topics that have been talked about in this speaker series, this is the most distributed, both over time and over geography, of all of the great wonders that we've been talking about. Most of the other great wonders are fairly concentrated in one particular location and have one particular um, historical point in time with which they're associated. The Great Wall, or the Great Walls as I'm calling them, are something very, very different. They, in, in terms of their, the span of time over which they were constructed, they, they cover um, 2,000, 2000 years to, to, to the, the first approximation. They also cover an incredible range of, of geography from covering all of the, the Chinese, the, from the west of the Chinese heartland right the way to the east, east coast. Um, that makes it a difficult topic to introduce. So I, and, and, and it also means it's an incredibly rich topic because any one of those periods or locations can be sampled um, and discussed in great detail. So what I've tried to do for this talk is to begin by thinking about their status as a great wonder and what, when, when, when they attain that status as a world-class monument that deserve that, deserve that name. And for that, we need um, to thank um, the Jesuit observers who, in the 17th century, um, wrote glowing accounts of the civilization they'd found in, um, in the Far East um, and mentioned the wall specifically. That was one of the, the, the highlights of their descriptions. And it's thanks to them that the Great Wall, for the last 300 years in the, in the European imagination, has had this very, very resonant status. But there's been a something in the last um, 30 years in the West, there's been something of a debunking of that status, partly because of some misunderstandings on the part of those early observations, most prominent of which um, is, was the idea that this wall was in continuous existence, there was a single wall that was in continuous existence for the period of time that I've been talking about. Um, and that's the one that, that was the one point, of point made by the Jesuits that does today need some tweaking, but that tweaking's been done. So in the talk today, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna labor that point, I'm, I'm, we're gonna acknowledge it, and then we're gonna go back to thinking of the wall as a much more continuous phenomenon than that debunking exercise has um, led us to sometimes to, 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 to claim. So let me begin by, there's our key word for the day. We all need, we have to, it's a, it's a Chinese topic, we have to learn at least one word of Chinese if, um, uh, for the evening, chang chang. That's the Chinese word in current use and in ancient use to describe this series of constructions along China's, China's borders. Chang, not great, but long, extended. If you want, if you want a, a really recherche translation for that phrase, extended bulwarks would be a perfectly adequate description of what, what this was. Chang is, a, is an earthenwork construction usually used both today and in the past to describe um, a monumental defensive wall, around, usually enclosing a settlement, usually enclosing a, a, a city. And indeed, the word sometimes translated as a city. So the idea, the idea of this phrase, chang chang, was, is, is to say a chang, a defensive bulwark, but not of the usual kind that goes around a city, of which there had been plenty of examples before the intensive periods of wall building, but rather one that is extended out across the landscape to inhibit motion across it. Right, that, so that's, that's, those are the implications of the, of the Chinese term. It, that's the, that's, the, that's the, the wall of myth that we're, we're most associated with. That's the one that's been, the, the, the debunking attempts have been targeted at. The, 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 the obligatory photo opportunity on diplomatic occasions up in the suburbs north of Beijing, where um, the, the, the buildings that you can see behind it are those iconic views of the Great Wall, which we associate with that term. Um, they've, all, they've, all, they've all done it, one after another. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't find any of... Um, uh, George the first, but 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 he, but he, I'm sure he went there too. Um, let, but here we go. So his, let's, let's, so let's, let's wind back. That's, that's that's the current status of this of this monument or this set of monuments as a great wonder of the world. It gets that status from this this book most prominently, the um, China Illustrator, China Illustrate, the monuments of China Illustrated, um, put together by on the basis of reports by his um, Jesuit colleagues by Athanasius Kircher in the, in the 17th century. And this is the frontispiece to his book, showing two of his Jesuit colleagues, one in a Mandarin's uniform and one, uh, one in, in the uh, ecclesiastical dress, unveiling, or rather having unveiled for them with the help of this, this cherub, a vision of China, prominent in which is that snaking line that I, I assume you can all see adequately on the screen here. We've got another shot in the, ne in the next slide of a crenellated, continuous 
set of defensive fortifications stretching across the north, the north of China. Um, and, and this is, a, and he begins very, um, the, the book with a, an introduction of, Kyrgyz's interests were, were, were diverse. He was fascinated by Egypt. He himself had never been to China, and he was relying on, he, he'd wanted to, to go very much on a, on a mission with the Jesuits who had arrived in the Ming court at the very end of the Ming dynasty and had um, uh, uh, remained in China during the transition into the subsequent Manchu dynasty. Um, so, but he never visited himself, so he was relying on the detailed accounts provided by his um, Jesuit colleagues. Um, and he begins the book, his, he begins his description of China with um, a detailed account. Oh, there's one more, sorry, there's, there's the, the, the more detailed view of the, of the wall stretching across. The most prominent of all, of all the monuments that are illustrated besides the major cities, it's the wall that stands out in his imagination and in his depiction. Um, and this is what he has to say about it. So this is, this is within a page or two of the beginning of Kircher's um, China Illustrata, China, the monuments of China Illustrated. In the north, it's separated, that's to say China, is separated by an immense desert and a wall that's 900 Italian miles long. I'll leave you to figure out how long 900 Italian miles is. The wall was built, you'll notice throughout the lecture that the, 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 the figures for the length of the wall vary highly, but here we've got a figure of 900 Italian miles. The wall was built by King, now I don't know how to pronounce that, I don't know how, to pro, I don't know how um, Kierke would have pronounced it, and it's certainly not how the Chinese, his, the Chinese informants who are responsible for this information would have pronounced it. It should probably be Qin, uh, because that he gets this date right, and, and the, 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 um, the king is the king of Qin, who's, who's, a, uh, who's associated with the first substantial building of walls as defenses in the north but somehow it's been lost in translation, or more likely in copying error, and has ended up being spelled X-I-O. You can probably find it in the Latin original on the right-hand side. Um, so, lost in translation there, but, but, but it's the right, the right person. The wall was built by King, the King of Qin about 200 years before our Savior, let's say about 200 BC. He's got the date more or less right. The, the, the date for the, the, the first substantial building of the Qin Wall, which we'll come to in, a, in, the, in the next slide. Um, uh, was about that date, about 221 BC was the date of the unification of um, the Chinese heartland by um, the King of Qin, subsequently the Qin Emperor, of terracotta warrior fame. That's who we're talking about. Um, with the labor, and then he goes on to talk about the, 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 the magnitude of the, pro of the project. With the labor of thousands of men, against the invasions of the Tartars. Now, they weren't Tartars then, but, the, he's talk, but again, we have a lot of uh, terms for these nomadic groups or pastoral groups distributed north of the Chinese heartland, non-Chinese speaking populations. And it was against one of those, or multiple of those populations that the Qin built their first wall. Um, so he's using a later term, Tartar, to describe these, these same populations north of the wall at the time of its supposed first construction. It was built over an extended period of five years. Armed with its fortifications, it still stands as a giant mass. Now that's the claim that's been subject to debunking, right? The idea that this monument, this, this wonder of the world constructed 200 years BC is what you could see in the northern suburbs during your, photo, your diplomatic photo opportunity um, today. Um, and that's, that, that's the point of attack for, all, for, 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 for those who are dis debunking this, this myth of China. No, this myth of the, of the Chinese Great Wall. However, the point that I want to make in the, in the, in the slides that follow is that the, the, pro, the, the process of, build, of constructing these walls and of, of, of rebuilding them was, was always done with reference to precedent and often done in very similar regions to where the early walls were constructed. So even the Ming, the Ming dynasty, who are responsible for those dramatic um, visions of, 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 of defense that one sees in, in the photographs on the previous slides, they were building those with the knowledge that this had been a strategy adopted on and off for 2,000 years. And the continuity that, that um, Athanasius Kircher is aiming for in this passage is actually not a, ba not a bad approximation to, to how it was viewed over, over uh, the 2,000 years within China. Um, so it still stands as a giant mass. The other, the other point that archaeology has made um, it possible to see, that that's archaeology of the 21st century, the very, very recent archaeology, is that a great deal of the original Qin constructions which are not salient features on the landscape if one's up close, nevertheless from aerial photographs and from careful survey, are nevertheless very much still there as um, a giant mass. That giant mass of stone and earth and other building materials are still are very much still there. In that sense, although Kircher couldn't possibly have known that, he was correct. 
The wall alone is an admirable work, which the ancients would surely have included among the seven wonders of the world if they had known of it, right? So, that, so there, there's our, that it's being incorporated into this, this, this idea of a list of spectacular constructions um, that, that, that all educated people in the world should, should know about by Athanasius Kircher um, in, in, the, in the 17th century. The other, the other point that I, I, I will get to is, like, as we go through the slides is how this um, knowledge of the work, which is, as you can see, it's, it's fresh knowledge at this stage. And all, the other thing that I, I want to do as, we, as the talk goes on is to look at um, uh, the early observations of this wall that brought that knowledge of the wall to us. By, so extramural observations, if you like, not from Chinese texts, but from visitors from the northern side who were voyaging overland to China and who were able to, to, to witness it at first hand. But not everybody is so... Um, positive about the wall. Um, uh, whoops, excuse me. Um, the wall has always had um, an oscillating status within China. On the one hand, it's been the, the, the project of, the, of, of, of military planners within China at various stages intended to, to safeguard the kingdom. At the same time, it's always had its bleak side. There's a, there's a, there's a steady trickle of negative opinion about, about the wall and its consequences. This is from uh, a, a very short, this is the entire entirety of the text, a short little prose poem, really, by Lu Xun, the, 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 the great leftist writer of the, of the early 20th century, lamenting this great wall and reimagining a wall of a slightly different kind, a wall of ideas that he's, of, of traditional culture that he sees as hemming, hemming in um, him and his, his Chinese compatriots. Our wonderful great wall, this engineering feat has left its mark on the map and it's probably known to everybody with any education the whole world over. Actually, all it's ever done is work many conscripts to death. So there's the flip side. The, the wall is this spectacular monument to, um, to, to military engineering, but at the same time produced at vast human cost. And that's a steady stream through, a steady thread throughout all, all of the literary depictions of the Great Wall. It never kept out the Huns. Well, it did, but it also repeatedly failed to do so. And we'll look at some examples of how, how it fails to do so. <laughs> And again, Han is another one of the, the translators used that word there. there are, again, it's from that large repertoire of words like Tartar and Han to describe these northern nomadic populations, these pastoral populations north of the Great Wall area who um, intrude upon it occasionally and whose mobility is the, the wall is designed to prevent. Now it's merely an ancient relic, but its final ruin will not take place for a while and it may even be preserved. I'm always conscious of being surrounded by a great wall. Now here he's talking about, well, I'll leave it to you to imagine exactly what kind of mental great wall he's envisaging here. The stonework consists of old bricks, old ideas, old, old notions that he and his colleagues during this period were envisioning a China that was, would be something to renewal and dis discarding of some of those old bricks. Reinforced at a later date by new bricks, as to say, new ideas, but ones that are still not liberating uh, the Chinese population from, from it, its hemming in by this imaginary great wall. These have combined to make a great wall that hems us in. When should we stop reinforcing the great wall with new bricks? A curse on this wonderful great wall. And that's about as negative as they ever get. But we'll, we'll look at a, some oscillating descriptions of very, very positive statements by military planners and much more pessimistic um, uh, accounts focusing on the, 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 the loss to uh, human happiness caused by, caused by the construction of these walls. It has a very, the, the wall, even the, the word Changchang and, and, and the wall itself has um, a very, very special status within um, the Chinese imagination, as you can imagine. And it's one that currently is formally, is, is very firmly linked in a positive sense by its place in the national anthem. I don't, I don't know how many of you can mentally sing the Chinese, Chinese national anthem. But in the second, the, the Great Wall features very, very prominently. I can, but, but, um, but, but uh, it's, 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 as, as our national anthems go, it's quite a good tune. Um, but there we go. There's the, 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 the song of the volunteers. It did, it, the, 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 the tune and the, um, the words didn't begin as a national anthem. They began as a patriotic song written in the 1930s, the song of the volunteers, during the campaigning in, in the northeast in Manchuria against the, the, the Japanese. I mean, the Japanese had colonized the Korean peninsula for a period before that and were making encroachments into um, formerly Qing dynasty, Manchu dynasty territory. Um, and this is now subsequent, subsequent to the, the, the fall of the, of, the, of the Manchu dynasty. But there we go. Now, again, it's an interesting exercise to, although I think in, in most people's imagination, the, 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 the simple reading of this is, is as a, um, uh, a positive, um, literal um, understanding of the, of the greatness of the Great Wall. However, 
um, I think a more careful reading suggests that although it's embedded in the Chinese national anthem today, the way in which it was originally conceived as being a part of that national anthem is more aligned with Lu Xun's remarks on the in, the, in his prose poem on the previous slide. Rise up those who would not be slaves, build our new great wall, right? Not, not the old one of bricks and stones, but again, that imaginary great wall, that, that, that ideological defense um, of, of national identity from our blood and flesh. Um, but nevertheless, there's the, the first publication of, in which, in which this, 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 the, the music and the words appeared, um, showing Chinese volunteer troops campaigning in, in the region of the Great Wall. The Great Wall, you can probably just make out in that rather grainy slide stretching across the landscape there. So there's a literal depiction of it there. But the words themselves are of a, an imagine, about a concern on an imaginary Great Wall, uh, um, uh, a Great Wall of the Mind, a new Great Wall built of, uh, built of sacrifice again. Interestingly enough, and this is, this is, this is really an aside, but um, the, the, the late 1970s, as you know, was a, well, the, the 60s and the late 60s and the early 70s are a very traumatic period for China, one of, one of many traumatic periods, but one in which there was great instability in how national icons and, I, and ideological thinking was um, uh, sustained. Great, 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 great um, changes were taking, it was very difficult to maintain any, any, any um, uh, uh, stable understanding of, of, the, of what it meant to be the new Chinese nation that had been founded after the Communist Revolution in 1949. And so the words were changed. Um, build our new great wall from our blood and flesh is the old, the old version. And for a brief time, interestingly enough, in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, the great wall was removed altogether from the national anthem. Perhaps again because of, because of the, the negative implications of the original song, but also the, 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 the dissatisfaction with the, the great wall as a symbol of China. Instead, the line in the, in the, in that, for that brief period of time read, may the great Communist Party lead us to continue the long march. Um, the reason for that substitution is, um, I, I don't know what debates would have been had about changing those lines, but it's, it's, a, it's a, also a play on words. The two words, great wall, or as, as we know, long, long wall, and long march, are very, very close in pronunciation, chang chang and chang zheng. Um, so it, it, for that reason, I suppose it was a fairly natural substitution to make, to refer to this, this this, this iconic moment in Communist Party history, when the, the uh, when when uh, the, 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 the the army moved from the south of China right up through the through the north in this very grueling expedition known as the known as the Long March, but the current version of the of the uh, of the national anthem has gone has reverted to its original statement, in which the Great Wall can, if with 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 some effort, be understood as that that monumental construction, that wonder of the world that that that, that you have photo opportunities at north of, in the suburbs north of Beijing. I need to show a few um, in any in any talk items from our own collection. We don't have um, anything. Um, intimately connected with the Great Wall, but we do have all sorts of items that could be brought in to tell the story. These items, I don't know whether you um, recognize what they are, but these are ones that um, a student in our department has been working on recently, and there's an article appearing in Expedition um, imminently um, introducing these. They've been in the collection a very, very long time, but they were neglected. Nobody paid much attention to them, so it's good that they've been getting some attention. They are from they were produced in the first millennium BC by one of these populations, one of these pastoral nomadic populations north of um, what was sub prior to there being any great wall up there um, in, that, in that region. And as you can see, they both focus on um, domesticated animals, the, 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 the very, very beautiful depiction of horses on the top, top example. Both of these, by the way, are very, very tiny. They're, they're small bronze plaques. And these were the distinctive items of material culture that were associated with um, nomadic pastoralist groups north of the Great Wall area, against whom, when it was built under the, first constructed under the Qin, and subsequently, it was intended to um, inhibit. Um, the reason for this, so why, 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 why are walls a, a, a permanent feature of the, of the, of the, of, of the North Chinese relationship with its, with its neighbors? Um, for ecological reasons. Um, the line of the Great Wall consistently, and this is the point I'm trying to make, is that, is that although the physical structure that we see north of Beijing today, built by the Ming Dynasty, is not the physical structure that the Qin built 2,000 years earlier, nevertheless, the model for interaction, the model for um, defensive constructions was exactly the same one, it applied repeatedly within that span of time. Um, here we've got a map of precipitation in China. And as you can see, have I got a, let me see if I've got a, do I have a pointer on this? 
Does anybody, does anybody at the back know that I've got a pointer or not? Oh, there we go. I can, I can point. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I can point down here. Um, we're going to be looking repeatedly at this region here, the Great Bend in the Yellow River, um, that where it, where it rises out of the, out of the, um, the periphery of the Tibetan Plateau, sh shoots up north, bends over across eastwards, and then comes back down again before um, uh, traversing a, um, the, the, the North China Plain to reach the sea. And as you can see, there's a gradient, a north to south gradient from South China that extends right through that region and beyond, becoming increasingly desiccated over time. So within, this, within south of, of where that great bend in the, in the Yellow River lies are areas where intensive rain-fed agriculture is possible, um, helped also by irrigation, of course. To the north of that region, rain-fed agriculture without the help of irrigation is very, very has been very, very difficult. And that produces that, that ecological Klein, that, that, that ecological gradient produces also a, a social and political gradient. South of, within the southern end of that, that spectrum, dense populations fed by that rain-fed agriculture are able to concentrate in permanent cities intimately tied to their agricultural production. Whereas in the northern area, although there's, there are occasional, there's occasional resort to agriculture, it's much more, it, it, the, the region is not capable of sustaining those dense population. So the population is much more dispersed and, and crucially much more mobile. And it's the mobility that explains why, we, why this barrier was repeatedly thought to be necessary. Um, horse, we saw on the previous slide with the, with the bronze plaques, the horse is incredibly important for those populations in the, in the north. They were able to produce and train and breed horses to a much higher standard than, 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 were able in, than, 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 than um, they were in the south. Um, and that, the mobility and that, that lack of a tie to large, dense settlements made them persistent, a persistent threat to, to, the, to, the, to the more southerly Chinese populations. So, and that, that hasn't changed. That's the, that's the underlying Kierke in that sense, although he wasn't thinking in ecological terms. That's, that's, he was right in that sense of there being a constant model for the contrast between these regions that persists until the horse ceases to be the quickest way of moving around, the, the, the quickest way of, of getting between two places, displaced, of course, by um, motorized transport, the telegraph, and um, uh, modern weaponry. Okay, there's a close-up of, we'll, we'll see some more, some more pictures of this same region, but the Great Bend in the Yellow River, uh, where, it, where it reaches north and goes deep, thrusts deep into the, into the steppe region, into the, into the pastoral nomaded, nomad area, um, and then comes back, back south again. So controlling that area is what the Qin were trying to do, it's what the, the Ming Dynasty were trying to do, and not just the, those two terminal points of our history, but all the way through, control over that region, for the reasons I just mentioned, is, is why there was continual resort to the building of walls. There we go, there's the region, in a, in a, in a, the same region in a, in a satellite um, map. Again, the, 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 ve the cover by vegetation is very, very visible in this particular image here. And the the, the, although we, whoops, although we don't, I need to go back one. Although we um, uh, don't see the, the river, the Yellow River, very clearly depicted there, we can nevertheless see that line of green, right, that the, the, the reaches up north. Everybody can see that, I hope, reasonably clearly. There's that, there's that large rectangle of, of grayish yellow, which is the relatively desiccated area within the um, Ordos Bend, the, the, the bend in the Yellow River, um, but with a line of green along the banks of the, along the sides of the river where irrigation is possible and makes farming intensive. So control over that region is what most of the wall building is all about. Our first textual men or the first time we see that word Chang Chang, extended bulwarks or, or long walls, um, is during the the, um, the Eastern Zhou period. So prior to the uh, the, the Qin king mentioned by Athanasius, Athanasius Kircher um, by, by, by a few centuries, during a time when the, the Chinese heartland is divided by multiple competing Chinese-speaking and culturally allied states. And the earliest mentions of this great wall, of talking about of great walls, are walls between these states, not against the, the northern nomadic invader, but rather dividing up their territory between them. So they're, they're fulfilling the model of intensive agricultural-based, dense populations being administered by this state in a very, um, with, with, a, with a literate bureaucracy. So it's, it's very tight control by, um, by, by governments over their, over their territorial regions and over the populations as well. Governments, are the, 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 the political powers of this time, are able to mobilize their populations in a very, very uh, intense way. Um, they're able to tax them very intensely, they're able to finance large projects, and they're able to mobilize manpower. And that's what makes building the walls possible. 
So the early walls, there's one, for example, that you can see between Qi and Shu. Um, again, I'm not going to, let me see if I can, there we go. Uh, no, I'm having trouble, but you can see Qi spelled Q-I and C-H-U Chu. Those, those two of those warring states have a wall indicated between them on this particular map. And it was walls like that between these neighboring states that are the first textual, ref, textual uses of that word that we had on the, on, the, on the slide right at the beginning. But towards the end of that period, the state of Qin, who's the pink one, Q-I-N, in, in the far west, dominates all the others. And in a sort of cascade of domino toppling, uh, the Qin state vanquishes all its competitors further east. And that's the period that Athanasius Kircher is focusing on. The king of Qin is the, is the, is the, Qin, the final king of Qin, who, um, having displaced all his competition, unifies the Chinese-speaking world and then builds walls against his dead nomadic, his pastoral nomad competitors to the north. Let's have a look at, it's a very short account. All of the, all of the documents from this early period are scattered and brief, um, but nevertheless, they give it some insight as to what the motivations were for these early constructions. This, is a, this, this passage on the screen here is taken from the, um, the, the, the records of the historian by Sima Qian who was a, second, uh, a late, late second century BC Han Dynasty author. So he's writing about events 100 years prior to his time. And this is the, this is the passage that indirectly Athanasius Kircher was referring to when he, des when he described that misspelled King of Qin, XIO. He's referring to this, this, this very passage of text, which he wouldn't have read himself, but which had been digested for him and um, transmitted to, um, to, uh, to, to, to Europe. So in the 26th year of the first emperor, that's 221 BC, the year of the unification, um, the year when the, he stops being the, just simply the Qi, king of Qin but becomes the first emperor of, of a unified um, China. Uh, Meng Tian is the, is the general with whom the construction of this project is associated. He inherits his status as Qin general, attacks Qi, and remember Qi from the previous screen. There we go. Qi was the last of the... Uh, the last of the, of the warring states to, to hold out against Qin. So that's the final domino to topple in this cascade of, of conquest. So he, uh, the Qin general uh, attacks Qi and vanquished it. Qin, having united all under heaven, Meng Tian was commanded to lead a force of 300,000, so uh, a, round, a suspiciously round figure. He probably wasn't leading 300,000 in one single campaign to one single point in the north, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an impressionistic numerical um, sense of how dramatic this project was. And we're going to see, and it's not, it's not, in terms of the number of people who were involved in wall building at various stages under this reign, it's not an, it's not an overly ambitious figure. Um, but it probably wasn't a single campaign being led by one single general. Anyway, Meng Tian was commanded to lead a force of 300,000 to pursue the tribes of the north and to take the region south of the river. South of the river meaning south within that bend that we've had repeated, the so-called Ordos Loop or the, or, the, or the Great Bend in the Yellow River. Um, and to take the region south of the river. He constructed a long wall. Okay, there's another instance of our chang chang, right, our extended bulwarks, our, our, our long walls, following the topography to form, a, to form narrow passes, beginning at Lintao, and we'll see where that is in a second, and running to Liaodong. That's all the way from <clears throat> the very east of the Chinese-speaking world at that time to the very, um, to the very west, Lintao being in the west, uh, Liaodong being in the east. Um, Extending over 10,000 li. Now, a li is a Chinese mile, so it's about a third of a modern mile. Um, and there we go. We see, again, we see these figures cropping up all the time. You have to keep some mental, mental track of, of, of how long we're talking about. But this is yeah, about 3,000, over 3,000 modern miles. The army was abroad for more than 10 years. So in this very compressed, this is, that's it. That's, that's all there is in this, in this passage. A very, very brief description of, of the events during, during the, uh, immediately after the Qin unification. Um, we see, what we're, actually, it's not a single campaign. It's a series of very, very dispersed wall construction projects that, that occur right the way around the boundary of the, of the, the, the Chinese-speaking world. And um, in very intensive work by Chinese archaeologists in the last two decades have brought to light what Kircher described as, the, as the, the, pers the persistence of this great wall constructed at that time. Now, again, as I've, as I've already mentioned, Kircher did, wouldn't, couldn't possibly have known that these, mod these aspects of the monument survived, but there they are on the Chinese landscape in a much eroded form, admittedly. But nevertheless, this intensive survey, often in very remote regions, um, allows us to see the, the walls that were constructed at that date. These ones are all from the very western end 
um, uh, and these were done in a, in a, in a, in a survey by, uh, uh, by Gansu Provincial Archaeologists in 2007. Um, this, is a, this is actually not slightly later, the, 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 uh, but the important point here, the one that I, uh, that I want to return to repeatedly, is that this is a, all of these projects throughout the 2,000 year span of, of, of wall building are done with reference to precedent. They're done with textual reference to precedent, but they're also done, as this photograph shows, with reference to the, the physical presence of the wall on the ground. The, 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 the triangular cross-section mound, the rather, the rather low grass-covered mound that you can see um, on the inside of this photograph is a Han Dynasty rampart, so a, a, a century or two after the, the, the Qin construction that we've been talking about. The one on the outside, with a much more sheer, it's survived with much more sheer, a much more sheer um, surface uh, without, without vegetation on it, that's a Ming Dynasty, earthen construction. So there they are, um, 1,500 years later, following the line of the Han Dynasty wall. So in that sense, it is very much a, continuous, a continuously maimed, maintained feature of the, of, the, of the landscape. Again, Kierke was right in our debunking of the myth um, is, is only, is, the necessary is, is, is one that we, we can't take too far. Not only did um, Meng Tian build um, walls to the, to the, uh, the north, towards the northern end of the, of the Great River Loop, um, there was also constructed a, 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 a highway traveling from the Qin capital, which is down at the, on the bottom, the bottom limb of that rectangle of, of, of space, up north in order to service the wall, to service the garrisons which were built up there. And that's not a monument that's easy to see at all on the ground. But from aerial photographs, including this one done by the, 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 this, the, during a survey by the National Museum of China in 2005, shows an enormous strip of land that was flattened in order to provide access to this wall. Because building the wall um, required a supply line going back to the agricultural heartland in order to feed the huge numbers of people who are up there, both building it and maintaining it subsequently. And that's of what that thin strip through, again, very um, underpopulated regions is that you can see on the, on the photograph there. Just to, so you have a sense where some of these places are. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and use this one here. There we go. So Lin Tao, do you remember, do you remember the passage from Sima Qian's record of this story? And it mentions this, this, 10, 000, this wall of 10,000 Li beginning in Lin Tao in the west. Well, that's Lin Tao down there um, uh, on the, 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 the leftmost of those, of those um, uh, pin drops there. Um, and stretching all the way to, well, the peninsula that you can see stretching down south um, westwards up in the top corner is the Liaodong Peninsula. So that's the, the, the span over which these const constructions were built um, in, the, in, the, in the third century BC. The, the photographs that you saw on the previous slide, including that one, are all within the, 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 great, the, 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 the great straight road that goes from the, from the Qin capital north up to service the walls um, is at that location, somewhere in that, in that location up there at the top, yeah, in, the, in, the, in the modern city of Ardwasu. The Qin capital, by the way, I forgot to mention, is down at the bottom there. So a straight road running, that's about 400 miles, 400 of our modern regular, regular miles, from the, from the Qin capital up to the, 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 the limit where, where, the, where the river bends over and where the um, Meng Tian was building his uh, fortifications. Oh, one other very, very wonderful shot of something that probably on the, on the ground would not be um, terribly spectacular, but from the air is an absolutely spectacular Qin period um, uh, defensive settlement um, found during that same survey. For scale, you've got some modern buildings down at the, oops, again, I'm having trouble moving the, moving the mouse, but down on the, in, the, in the bottom right-hand corner, there are some, some modern buildings down there, so absolutely, do, absolutely dwarfed by this, by this um, Qin Dynasty cons construction. So, as, as, again, as Kierke said, it's all, it's, it's persisted through time as a great mass. Um, uh, one more shot, um, on, uh, again, within the, within, within the, the, the Yellow River Loop over to, towards the, the um, southwest um, side, the Qin Dynasty Great Wall snaking across the hills, still very, very visible in an aerial photograph. And they're down on the ground. In this case, constructed not with earth. The, the, the techniques for construction vary according to what the building materials that are available locally. But here we've got um, dry stone walling. There's no, there's no mortar between those, those slabs. They're, they're piled up with the rubble in between and then the, the neatly arranged um, rocks on the side. And that's, that's that same stretch of wall um, within, the, within the, um, the Great Bend in the Yellow River, built during the Qin Dynasty. But as we said, 
um, there's a perpetual note of criticism. So spectacular achievement to, 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 to build these, these, these great, these great um, walls um, around the Qin Empire. But Sima Qian, who provides us with that account, um, adds his own, as he, as he always does at the end of each chapter, he adds his own commentary on what's gone before. He's gathered together his historical sources and he's told us, that, given us the facts, and then he adds a, a reflective note at the end of each of his chapters. And this is what he has to say about the, the great straight road and the Qin fortifications. I travel to the northern frontier, returning by the straight road, so returning by that, 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 that road you saw in the satellite photograph, and observed on my travels the forts of the Long Wall constructed by the Qin, ringing the mountains and blocking the valleys. When Qin had first eliminated the rival rulers, the hearts of the people were not yet settled. So again, this question of the priorities of uh, the rulership, the priorities of, of state building by, by those in power, and the, uh, the, the ethical duty towards the, the populations involved. Who are the ones who have to do the building? So the, the, the hearts of the people were not yet settled, and their bruises and wounds had not yet healed from the conflict with the other states, from the domino toppling of those warring states at the, at the end of the warring states period. Um, yet the distinguished General Meng Tian, the, the man who we we're told is responsible for the war, did not take the opportunity for forceful remonstrance, for addressing the commoners' needs, for caring for the old and the, or the orphaned, and for building harmony among the masses. Instead, he went along with the plans for mobilizing labor for this enormous construction project. Thus, was it not fitting that he and his brother met with punishment? And we'll, we'll get to this in a second. What was that nonsense about offending the banes of the earth? Well, there's a little bit of a story there. He, he, this is all part of the, the, the biography of Meng Tian that occurs in that chapter in the records of the historian. Meng Tian, having achieved this spectacular feat of leading, leading a, an, an army and a construction crew to, to, to complete these, these, monument, these, these, these um, monumental um, defenses in the north, wins great fame for himself for doing so. He's, 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 a, he's a prized general for having, having done this. But with the succession of the, of the monarchy, the, the Qin Emperor dies, and his, and his subsequent replacement has a, is, has a very negative view of many of the prominent figures who were prominent under, his, um, under, under, the, under the, the first Qin Emperor. And Meng Tian is, in fact, asked to commit suicide. And, he's, and the, the criticism that is offered, or a, a trumped-up charge if ever there was one, was that the construction of this monument had offended, there's the phrase, down the road, had offended the veins of the earth, that the building of this monument had cut through those, uh, the, those veins of, 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 of the land, um, uh, a, a, a mystical, entirely trumped-up charge. But that's, that's what, the, that's what the, the, the chapter by Sima Tien has to say about it. And he ends by so making the point that not that he doesn't deserve this um, criticism, that he doesn't deserve punishment, and he is his brother also loses favor with the, with the new emperor. Um, it's not that they don't deserve it. They deserve it for something entirely different. What they deserve criticism for is the immense expense of human life in, in, in building this, the, these fortifications um, and, not, and, not, and not the nonsense about cutting through the veins of the earth. So there we go. Uh, um, we've oscillated back in the space of 100 years from a very optimistic um, construction project to a very negative statement by China's first great historian about wall building. The Han, too, though, um, invested very, very heavily in um, managing the threat to um, the nomadic pastoral populations to their north. They also built very, very long defensive lines out into um, um, the north and, and particularly towards the west, much further than the Qin had done. And they maintained those um, su with, with supply lines and with a very elaborate system of administration. And so many of the, doc the administrative documents from those um, regions um, have been excavated in the 20th century and provide a very detailed uh, um, vision of what it meant to administer these um, outposts very, very far away from, from the capital. Um, I'm not going to dwell on the, the, the hand fortifications, though, but I'm going to jump to a slightly less um, uh, often emphasized period of wall building in the period of disunity between um, the Han Dynasty and the Tang that, that followed um, several centuries later. Um, the wall building that um, I want to look at now. Again, any excuse to get um, an item from the galleries into, into the slideshow. Nothing to do with great walls, other than the fact that it was, this is from the Northern Way. So this is from um, um, one of the dynasties that ruled parts of North China um, after the, in, the, in, the, in the period of disunity between the, the fall of the Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. Now, they were, um, amongst other things, 
preoccupied for long periods of time with um, the Buddhist religion. They were what's the, they, 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 they constructed very um, uh, dramatic Buddhist cave temples that, are, that, that survive today in both Datong in, in northern Shanxi and in Luoyang down in Henan. So the two of the most famous um, repositories of stone monuments um, that survive today were constructed under, under this particular um, uh, monarchy. They were themselves people of the northern steppe who had moved into, they, they were originally not a, a, an ethnically Chinese group, but they had moved into the northern periphery of um, the Chinese uh, heartland um, after, the fall of the, uh, after, the, after the fall of the Han Dynasty. And uh, this is one of their, uh, from right at the end of their reign period, this is, you can see in the, in the, in the gallery today. Um, there we go, that's where their capital was. As you can see, we've, we've moved um, east ever so slightly from, the, from our previous preoccupation, which was with the, with, the, with the Yellow River Bend. We're now outside the Yellow River Bend. In the, uh, uh, Datong is the, the, the modern name of the, of the city where the Northern Way had their first capital, and where they had their capital until 494 BC. And in 494, sorry, 494 CE, 494 CE, and it was in that year that they made the decision to, to move that capital, to relocate that capital down to Luoyang. That's what it was called. Um, that's what it's always been called. It's still called Luoyang today. Again, a span of about 400 miles, a very long move towards the, the Chinese, into the, into the Chinese heartland, into the agricultural zone, and away from um, their, 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 their steppe origin. And at about the same time as that move was taking place, we have another very interesting text, a memorial by a man called Gao Liu, who was a, um, a, a prime minister to the, to the state of, uh, to the Northern Wei state, advocating building walls. And again, in this particular text, we see nothing at all of the, of the, of the, of the negative side. Or we, in fact, find a very optimistic, very upbeat assessment of what it means in human terms to go about building walls. So let's have a look at that. This is his memorial, now as I say, about the same time as the move of, this, uh, of the capital from the, the edge of the steppe zone down southwards into the Chinese heartland. They now have the problem of what to do about their northern defenses. And he, he, be, he begins the memorial by saying, it would be appropriate now to follow old precedent. So again, old precedent. This idea of wall building is a continuous one. It never goes away entirely. Every one of these dynasties who's trying to maintain a, an agricultural um, uh, uh, society administered with, with dense populations in, 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 in cities, um, administered by a literate bureaucracy, all have this problem of dealing with the people who are not doing that, who are distributed to their north, who are raiding, and much more mobile than they are. So he says it would be appropriate now to follow old precedents to construct long walls, there's that word again, chang chang, in continuous use throughout this period, to the north of the six garrisons. So they, they had six garrisons distributed in the, in the north of the, um, the, the region which they occupied, to prevent incursions from the north. Although it would be a burden in terms of short-term effort, it would be of long-term advantage, and once complete, would benefit a hundred generations. So a very optimistic um, statement about the value of wall building. Not at all um, dissuaded by um, previous statements about the, the inadequacy of, of, of these kinds of constructions. He, 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 I, I haven't, I'm not going to translate the whole, the, whole, the whole passage, but he advises the training of a force of 60,000 men in this case, uh, and advocates that they, they meet once every 10 days. They're presumably drawn from, a, from an agricultural population. They meet once every 10 days in the capital to, to, to practice, um, the, to, to get ready for this, this expedition to the north. 20,000 archers, 20,000 halberdiers, and, um, and, and 20,000 cavalry. So um, a limited use of, of horses, but, but um, with also this very substantial um, infantry. If the nomads come to resist, so when, when we, he, so he advocates in a particular, in a particular month, they're going to, in, in, the, in the early summer, they're going to move north um, to, to take on the nomad threat. And if the nomads come to resist when we, when we move north, we meet them in decisive battle. If they don't come, we disperse to construct long walls. So there's the plan. Either we take them on in a, in a, in a direct battle, or else if they're not there, if they're not willing to join us in battle, then we dis disperse the troops and begin this process of wall construction all over again. Since the distance between the six garrisons is less than a thousand li, and since the labor of one man for a month is sufficient to construct three paces of wall, so try to imagine that three, three strides long of wall can be built by one person in one month, according to this memorial. Um, 300 men will complete three li, 3,000 men will complete 30 li, 30,000 men will complete 300 li. So that's about 100 miles, right? So averaging the difficulties over the span of 1,000 li with a total force of, there's an error on my part, there, that the original text is 100,000 men. If you do the math, that's what it should be. In one month, it will certainly be completed. So he's got, he's, he has a vision of 100,000 men, the, the 60,000 troops, um, and the, the, the non 
fighting wall builders who are going to construct the wall he needs in the space of one month. Um, the grain supply for a month would not be excessive, so he thinks we can do it. We've got, we've got, we've got the grain reserves and the, 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 the infrastructure to supply this um, expeditionary force and wall building force um, for a period of a month when, when they're going to do the building. The grain supply for a month would not be excessive, thinking of the eternal benefit they would labor without complaint, right? So a very, very optimist, given all the, pre whoops, given all the previous warnings that we've had from Sima Tien and from others about the, the downside of construction, the human cost of building these walls. Here's a memorial who, from, from, a, from a prime minister who seems untroubled by this. This particular expedition never happened. The memorial was, was given, but as I've said, they moved south to Luoyang and adopted a different strategy towards the step that didn't involve um, the building of the constructing of walls. But their immediate successes, um, oops, their immediate successes did. Uh, um, again, in the galleries upstairs, there are many examples of, um, of uh, other Buddhist monuments from the successor states to the Northern Way, the Northern Qi in particular. Um, that's, that's what fills our gallery upstairs. Um, and they were great wall builders. They, 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 they did fulfill the, 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 the goals of, of Gaoliu that, um, and of his um, uh, memorial to his, to his monarch. And so did the Sui Dynasty, who united um, China for a very brief period of time before the Tang Dynasty. They were also builders of walls. The overwhelming Tang Dynasty voice in, from literary sources is again swinging back to the negative voice, um, the, the pessimistic, don't build walls, whatever you do kind of voice. Um, and here's, here's one example of rather, which I hurriedly translated, so not a literary translation by any means, but I hurriedly translated, um, not being able to find an English, a ready-made English one um, in time for the talk, but um, so it's, it won't be beautiful, but it will, be, it will, I hope, be accurate. The line, but this is Wang Han writing in the early 8th century, so during the Tang Dynasty, um, uh, 200 years after the, 300 years after the memorial by Gao Liu, his lines on watering his horse at the wall. So returning, he's returning from an expedition against the, the pastoral nomads of the Northwest. And he's coming back and he encounters the remains of the wall that have always marked the landscape um, of, the, of the northern border. So returning, I water my horse at a hole at the long wall. Beside the road are many white bones. Asking an ancient local from what dynasty they came, he tells that they were the Qin king's troops uh, who built the wall. At dusk, the north side of the frontier is devoid of men. The wails of ghosts royal the heavens. Innocent of any crime, they were punished and, were, and unrewarded for their labor. Their lonely souls wander at the wall's side. What a fool, the king of Qin, to build the wall. It was heaven that defeated Qin, not the barbarians. Remember that? It's exactly the same mo idea in, in very, very different wording um, that we had previously. Right? It's not, it's not, it was in the end, it wasn't uh, 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 Lu Xun's um, comments on the wall. It wasn't in the end, it, wasn't, it didn't keep out the hunt. It was, it was an internal collapse that was responsible for the fall of the Qin. So it was heaven that defeated Qin. And by heaven, he means fate. He means, he means the natural playing out of the consequences of enslaving people to build these walls. So it was heaven that defeated Qin, not the barbarians. For once calamity, for once calamity arose inside that desolate wall, Xianyang, that's the Qin capital, on the Wei River was never again the capital. Right? So again, a very pessimistic, poetic but pessimistic description of the, 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 the shortcomings of, of wall building. We can't not have a session on the Great Wall without talking about this woman, Meng Jiangyu, an interesting figure from Chinese folklore. Is that name familiar to anybody? It features in every popular account of the Great Wall, Chinese or English, and so we can't not tell her story. It's an example of a, of a, of a meme, of a, of a, of a replicating um, idea that, like all good memes, is not only a very good replicator, but also one that evolves over time. So the first versions of her account occur um, from a period, from some of the very earliest literary texts from, from the Chinese tradition. Um, and the meme is originally a meme about the importance of ritual observance, of, 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 of courteous ritual behavior between uh, members of the, of the elite. The story goes that um, this, this, uh, uh, the, the king of Qi, now remember that's the last of the states that's defeated by the state of Qin, um, has been fighting a war against one of his neighbors. And um, the husband of this woman, uh, Qi Liang, dies in battle. And on his way home from the war, the king of Qi encounters the widow on the road and offers, her con offers, offers to her his condolences for the, for the loss of her husband. To which she replies, if you want to do this properly, if you want to offer me true 
ritually appropriate condolences, you come and see me at home. And the, the, so the, the, duly the, the, the king of Qi does that. That, meant that story has no walls in it, um, and it has no king of Qin in it. But that's the, that's the source from which um, this, this tale evolves and eventually becomes very, very closely tied. It becomes the most famous Great Wall-associated story. A later version of this, this tale um, has exactly the same woman and exactly the same king of Qi. Um, uh, and uh, after she's had her, her due um, respects paid by the king of Qi for the loss of her husband, she then goes to find the body of her, of her husband at the, at, the, at the city wall where he dies, and he's, she finds his corpse outside, outside the ramparts, outside the Chang, not a Chang Chang, not a long wall, but a city wall, um, where, where his dead body's lying. And she weeps for him. And the, the, Han, Dynasty period, the Han, Han period account says that you know, no, no passerby could fail to wipe away a tear at, the, at the, um, uh, the sight of this woman weeping for her dead husband outside the city wall. At which point, the wall too is moved and collapses. The city wall is moved and collapses. And this one image, then makes the, be, begins to become associated with great wall building. And instead of him being a, a victim of, 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 of conflict away from, without a wall, without a great wall context, this story then becomes associated with um, the great wall specifically. Instead of, uh, he, then, he then becomes a, a, one of the convicts who's responsible for building the wall, who's sent by the king of Qin, this cruel, um, stupid, foolish king of Qin who expends human effort on this, this folly um, to keep out the, um, the barbarian nomads. Uh, um, and, and she travels to the Great Wall and weeps, and the wall collapses and, and uh, gives up the body of this, this convict who's been buried within it. So and she becomes a, a, a figure of, of cult in this particular case. She's, she's a, like one, of, one of many female figures that have places in um, Chinese um, popular religion. This is um, a, a temple that survives at the very eastern end of the Great Wall um, today that has a depiction of her, a rather modern-looking um, um, image, although the building is the building is old, of of Meng Jiangnu, uh, the woman who goes to the wall and cries and, and has the wall in sympathy liberate her husband's bones. Um, it's such a um, it was such a popular tale that uh, does anyone recognise this photograph? Does that? It's a, again a very very wonderful photograph of um, of Paul Pulio in the in the caves at Dunhuang, um, retrieving his cache of manuscripts. As you as you probably know, Dunhuang was the one of the, the last stop if you're leaving China on the Silk Road, uh, or rather the first stop if you're leaving China, the last stop if you're coming into China, on the Silk Road. And uh, a, a cave at this, um, at this site was, was found in the early 20th century, walled up and containing an abundance of manuscripts. And there's Paul Pulio in there, the, the French explorer, taking his, taking, I'm afraid, the cream of the, of the, of the uh, Chinese manuscripts that were found there way back to Paris, where they are now. He was then followed by um, other people who also removed a great deal of material. But those, he found within there two versions of this, this legend of Meng Jiangnu. So it was a sufficiently popular Tang Dynasty account that it, it occurs in even relatively modest um, copies, like, like, like the ones you can see here, done um, uh, at, at Dunhuang. Uh, quite a nice illustration on the back of wall building. I mean, we're not, we're not going to read the text, but there we go. We've got um, a, a very hastily done sketch of wall building on the, on the frontier uh, to illustrate the story of Meng Jiangnu. Uh, and then the second version, also, also from Pulio's collection in, in, in Paris. The Ming are the ones who, did, who are responsible for those iconic buildings north of, north of Beijing. And they're also the first to leave to us maps that they themselves made of what they were up to. This is a 17th century um, book um, describing the um, region within the order, within the, within the Great River, the, the, the Yellow River um, bend. Um, the, the, if I can get a, uh, it doesn't seem to work on every slide, but in the, in the center there you can see the, um, the, 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 t the town that was founded as a, um, as a bastion south of the wall um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to mark the, the, the Ming Dynasty's northern border and to keep out the nomads. As you can see, the, the river runs across the very northern um, uh, edge of this, of this particular image here. And every single one of those marked points um, south of the wall is a, is a fortified town. It was an intensely militarized region of China during this period, and, this, uh, um, and beginning in the, in the, in the um, 16th century and then go, going through into the 17th. Having trouble advancing. Got a freeze, I'm afraid. I 
do apologize. There we go, that works. Just so you can see it a little bit more clearly, though, there's a, there's a, there's a black and white version of the same tool. The very intensively uh, fortified regions within, that, within the Great River Loop that we've, we've been discussing pr previously under the, under the um, Qin Dynasty. That's the, that's the location, right in the middle of the order. So that's where the Ming were building their um, major fortifications, the town of Yulin. And it's also at that same period when the Ming are doing their most intensive wall building that, um, that Europeans begin to get their first visions of the Great Wall, of the, of the one of Ming construction, of Ming Dynasty construction. This is one of the earliest maps to illustrate, to have the, have the Great Wall explicitly marked on a map of China. So this is from 1584, the heyday of Ming, of Ming wall building in the 16th century. Um, north on this particular one is to the, uh, to the right hand side of, of your screen. And it's, there's a, there's a, it's, it's, it's difficult to see on this particular image, but there's a very clearly marked um, crenellated fortification running right the way along, along that, that side of, of, of the, the yellow region, which is China. John Speed was an English map maker who cobbled together all sorts of um, other, both earlier maps and also bits of um, anecdotes about what was found in the regions that they described. And he also has um, a very clear depiction of the Great Wall. This is an interesting map for several reasons. So by, by this time, remember that um, for, the, for, for the medieval period, for, for in Europe is the medieval period, access to China had been overland. So if you wanted to reach China from Europe, you went via the north and approached China overland from the north. Beginning with the um, Portuguese outpost in Macau on the, on the south of China, navigation by sea became the gradually became the default path to China during the, um, the, the, the 16th and then 17th centuries. And this leads to a confusion. If you visited the same place from two different directions, potential observations of the same feature can end up getting duplicated. You've seen it from the north, you've seen it from the south, and you end up thinking they're two different things. And in fact, that's what happened to Peking. This map has two Pekings on it, two Beijings on it. One, let's see if I can get a close up, closer, up, closer view of the slide. There we go. So on the, on the, on the, towards the top of the slide here, you can see the, the word Kambalu, underneath Kathaya, which is the old name for, for, for China, for, 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 for Mongol China. Um, Kambalu was the Mongol capital of China. Further south, you can see, I don't know how clearly, but in between Quin and what should probably be pronounced Xi, underneath Quin Xi, you can see a separate Peking, appropriately la labeled as, as, as Pakin, right? So, so Beijing or Peking. There are two Pekings on this map. One, the old one that was known from the northern approach, and one um, that was known from the, the southerly approach, um, and that was the Ming, the, the Ming, the Ming name for the, for the capital. So we've got two of those. A few other things that we can't not mention on this map. How about that for a bit of lore that gets incorporated into one of the peripheral regions, the Tangut, who are one of the, um, one of the nomadic peoples of the, of the steppe who themselves founded a, um, um, a dynasty for a period several centuries prior to the Ming. Out of this kingdom, men will have all rhubarb be brought onto the map of Europe. Nothing, known, nothing mentioned about this location on the map other than the fact that it's a source of European rhubarb. Um, one other shot. Oh, there we go, finally the wall. So there's our earliest English map of, um, of the, showing the Great Wall, a wall of 400 leagues betwixt the banks of the hills, built of the King of China against the breaking of the Tartars on this side. So there we go. The Europeans have, by the 17th century, although they still think there are two Pekings, they're nevertheless um, fully aware of a, of, a, of a monumental fortification that, that, that blocks, that marks the northern border. And for the Ming Dynasty, it was the northern border of um, China. We also get some rather wonderful descriptions of approaches to the wall from the exterior. Uh, one of my favorites is the description by uh, Ivan Petlin, who was a Siberian Cossack, who was um, sent on a mission, not by the Tsar, in fact, but by um, the governor of Tomsk, that's in, in, in Siberia, um, to, to go and visit um, the, the king of China, or the emperor of China, the Wanli emperor, as it would have been. And this is only the second European expedition to actually reach China from the west by this overland route since the fall of the Mongol dynasty. So since the Ming, remember that um, Marco Polo and various other people had left accounts of traveling overland to, um, to China during the Mongol period. And it's occasionally been remarked that they made no mention of the Great Wall. Now, the reason why they didn't is because those, the, any, any Qin remnants of the Great Wall were by then entirely eroded 
un, un, unremarkable features of the landscape. The great, the spectacular Ming Dynasty fortifications were only built subsequent to those. And here's one of the, um, and this is one of the accounts that, that um, is subsequent to that period of Ming Dynasty wall building, where we get a report from a uh, European boots on the ground actually looking at um, at the wall from the approaching the wall from the from the northern side. Um, and then the first uh, Russian um, embassy to reach, reach Beijing. Um, that, the particular account that I'm going to quote, for, quote from is from um, a rather wonderful collection of travel, travelers' tales by, uh, called Pur Purchase's Pilgrims. Pur Samuel Purchase was a, never, went to, never went anywhere at all, but he collected a huge number of manuscript accounts that other the pilgrims of his, of his book, um, uh, Purchase's Pilgrims, were the, the people who did actually go to all these places and who left literate accounts that he, the written accounts that he then um, uh, gathered together in, in a series of volumes and provided a little bit of commentary in, again, the early um, 17th century at about the same time as that map that we saw on the, on the previous screen. Um, and here's the little, um, the short passage written by the, the, the Russian ambassadors as they um, approach the Great Wall from the north. By the way, they'd, um, their, 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 their um, trip was a mixed success. Among the documents that are preserved in um, Purchase's Pilgrims um, is a letter from um, the, the, the Alton Khan, who was one of the... Um, North of the wall, one of the one of the one of the powerful figures there, who was still still leading a, um, a, a, a substantially pastoralist population, and he had a very successful relationship with him. The um, uh, the, the Alton Khan sends back to the to the Tsar um, a letter um, asking for an exchange of gifts. He uh, offering things like. Um, three leopards with their claws and various other um, luxury items and asking for things in return. So that bit of the trip was relatively successful. They, the, the embassy was protected and hosted by, um, by the Khan. Um, they were much less successful on reaching um, Beijing when they were refused audience with the Wanli Emperor for not having brought um, the right, the ritually appropriate gifts. Um, so that, that aspect of the trip was not successful. But here's the moment when they cross um, from the territory of the Khan into the territory of the, of the Wanli Emperor. So they passed through his land, that's the land of the Altin Khan, five weeks to the country of Shera Mughali. Now, there are these wonderful names that um, are absolutely impossible to match up with any um, Chinese source um, because they've been so garbled in transmission. But there we go, Shera Mughali. They don't even match within the same text, as you'll see an alternative spelling for that same place in a second, where reigneth a queen called Manjika. Now, again, we know nothing about this queen Manjika other than the fact that these uh, Russian emissaries um, reported her existence. She apparently, she apparently was, the, was the one who was able to grant passage to the wall on behalf of the, um, the, uh, uh, the Ming dynasty, who caused to have provisions and post given them. In this country of Shera Morgula, now I just said that the same, the same word will be spelled differently in two, in two adjacent sentences. There we go, it's the same. The country of Shera Morgula. They traveled, four day, uh, they traveled four days and came into the dominions of Kate. Now, Kate is the old name for uh, China, right? Um, uh, called Krim. Now, Krim, again, a very interesting word, a Turkic word meaning wall. Right? He uh, purchased, Samuel Purchase doesn't seem to realize um, that that's what it means, but it's not the name for the region, but it's the name for the wall in the, 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 one of the languages of the steppe, the Krim. Where is a wall made of stone 15 fathoms high, alongst the side of which wall they went 10 days, where they saw petty towns and villages belonging to the Queen Manjika. But in those 10 days, they saw no people upon the wall at all. At the end of these 10 days, they came to the gate, wherein lie very great pieces of ordnance, shooting shot as big as a man's head. And in the said gate standeth in watch 3,000 men. And these are, the, these are the, the Chinese now. And they come with their merchandises to traffic at the gate. The Altine Mass, the men who have accompanied him with the Khan, they also come to the gate with their horses to sell to the Kate men. Now, remember, that's one aspect, that's one unchanging aspect of this steppe um, Chinese heartland relationship, the trade in horses. Um, the, 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 the northern horses were always superior, always better bred, always better um, trained, and were, were a constant um, source of, uh, they, were, they were a constant requirement by the Chinese military. And that's why the description here is of the trading of horses at the gate, with their horses to sell to the Cate men. Uh, but they're not permitted to come within the walls except very few at once. So here we have a description of the, su the successful role of the wall as a marking of China's northern border, um, a, a, a border town where, where trade is permitted, but where movement of any other kinds is largely restricted and, and, and prevented. Rolling on another, another hundred years, this is the, uh, to, the, to not a Russian embassy, but rather the, the first British attempt at making contact with the, the Chinese court after the fall of the Ming Dynasty, after the, after the walls have ceased to... Uh, serve their purpose as the northern barrier of China. But this is the image that um, inspired 
a hundred derivative um, romantic depictions of the wall in the, through engravings and various other ways of, of replicating it, done by one of the party, one of Lord McCartney, who was the, 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 the ambassador in 1793, attempting to, to um, set up trade relationships with the, with the, with the Manchu dynasty, depicting um, with, with, in watercolor the, the wall. And not only, not only romantic watercolors, but also very accurate um, depictions of the fortifications themselves in, 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 in painstaking detail uh, with accurate, accurate measurements. There you go, there's one last one. And my last vision of the war is from this lady here, um, who um, in 1920 took some of the first photographs of a bit of, a bit of the wall that's away from the, the main tourist sites in the suburbs of Peking, a little bit to the, um, to the, to the east, um, where she was hoping to find the Qin Wall. So she was, remember we said there's this, there's this myth of the wall that um, the, the Qin Wall is still some, somehow to be seen out there too. Um, not just from satellite photographs, but even, even up close to, uh, not just from aerial photographs, but also right up close to Beijing. Well, in fact, she was mistaken in thinking that she'd find it, but she does have quite a nice description of the very same point in the wall where the Russian ambassadors arrived um, 300 years earlier. So there she's on her camel on her way to the town of Kalgan. Now, Kalgan is, if you ask the way to Kalgan today, nobody will be able to tell you. Kalgan is the old name for the gate in the wall. It's, it's a Mongol word for, for gate. Um, now called Zhang by the Chinese name Zhang Jiaokou, and that's what the, the Chinese would have called it. But she's using the old name Kalgan to refer to this, this town, Zhang Jiaokou, not far from Beijing. And she's been to see, she's done, she's done the tourist thing and been to see those bits of the Great Wall um, north of Beijing. And is disappointed. It's a little disappointing upon arriving at the Nanko Pass to be informed that this, impressive though it be, is merely a relatively modern branch of the Great Wall itself, added no less than 1,700 years later to the original construction. She's talking about the Qin, the, the first Qin Emperor's wall, built, by, built with, as part of Meng Tian's expedition. To see the real Great Wall, then, the wall that has withstood the ravages both of Huns and Tartars. Now, she's, she's obviously been read, this is, this is, the, this is the, um, the Athanasius Kircher version of, of an unchanging single construction that survived the ravages of time and the ravages of Huns and Tartars. The wall that played a not unimportant part in warfare two centuries before the Christian era, this furnished me at least with an excuse to get away to Kalgan, and in a visit to Kalgan, the starting point for the historic caravans which penetrate the desert, across which prior to the existence of the Trans-Siberian Railway, all merchandise passed to the north. I foresaw the germ, of a, of a, 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 the germ which might, with a little luck, blossom into a little expedition across the frontier. So she sets off in 1913. Um, to take photographs. And there we go, we've got a few, a few of her photographs still survive. So this is, as far as I know, the earliest photograph of that gate through which the Russian embassy passed, right, where, where the horse trading got, and which used to, where the horse trading took place and where the, the Alton Khan's men met their Chinese counterparts and exchanged goods. That's the gate there today in the town of Zhang Jiaokou, or Kalgan, as she refers to it. With a modern, with a modern photograph, the, the, the one on the bottom is the is the view from outside, and the, the one on the top is the um, the view from um, the the interior. A reminder that walls crumble. Right, this is what she she had she had forgotten. She 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 was hoping to find at this slightly more remote location, removed from the capital, the original wall, the Qin Dynasty wall. But that's what happens to Ming Dynasty walls with the freeze thaw cycle and the ravages of of, of the elements brings them crashing down. This was in 2012. Um, a large section of that particular wall spontaneously um, collapsed. Um, how much more so um, has the Qin Wall been affected by that? So she was, she was disappointed. She didn't realize it, but she was disappointed in, in not, in fact, catching sight of the, 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 the Qin Dynasty Wall. Perhaps the reason why the wall at Chiang Jiao has for a long time been thought to be by, by these early, early um, Europeans in particular to be a surviving part of the Qin Dynasty Wall it's because quite a lot of it, and this is, this, I'm now stepping into some of my old slides, which I went down to the basement and blew the dust off. Um, uh, these are from the, the 1990s when I, um, uh, hikes on the wall when I was a language student in, in, in Beijing. Um, this bit of, if, as, as soon as you go a few, um, a, a mile or so away from Zhang Jiaokou, into, or, or Kalgan as she refers to it, the wall looks very different. It doesn't look like those uh, spectacular, orderly, battlemented constructions that you see around Beijing and on which presidents have their photographs taken. It's a much rougher um, uh, sloping pile of, of piled up stones. It does have mortar between them, unlike, unlike the Qin Dynasty wall, but this is, this, is, this is Ming Dynasty wall of a very much more humble kind. And this is what a lot of it looks like away from the major um, points that require defense, like Kalgan and like Beijing. 
So that's perhaps because of the state of the, 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 the construction of the, this, these stretches of the wall. People like um, uh, uh, Beatrix um, uh, thought that perhaps this might be the original Qin, surviving, uh, Qin Dynasty wall. There you go. There's a few, a few more final shots to end with of um, a very hikeable, a very pleasant hike across the, the hills from the town of Kalgan. Um, uh, uh, of Ming Dynasty wall, but using a very different construction technique from the one that you find um, uh, near Beijing. Again, Ming Dynasty constructions showing very much the ravages of time. Remember also that these, these are points on the landscape that provide, a, for anybody who's living nearby, provide a very ready source of construction materials, right? Um, <laughs> these would originally have been clad, the towers themselves, although not the wall, the towers, many of the towers would have been clad in um, brick originally, the bricks have all been hauled off, and then the, 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 the elements left to erode the beacon towers along the, along the wall. Oh, that shows, that was the, actually the slide I was thinking of in those remarks. You can see the scatter of bricks that have fallen down from the, from the beacon tower itself. Um, the Qin Dynasty didn't build, uh, didn't use bricks for their, for their, for their um, great wall building, um, but the Ming Dynasty did, and this is a, another Ming Dynasty beacon tower on that stretch of wall stretching away from Kalgan. A close up, you can just about see the mortar squeezed in between the, the stones which are gathered from the immediately surrounding hillsides to construct the wall at Zhang Jiakou. And there we go, an optimistic little plant. I don't, I'm, I'm not good at plant identification, but I wonder whether anybody can identify that thing emerging from between the, 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 um, the, the, the cracks in the walls. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm very, very... <laughs> I'm very, very grateful for your um, um, attendance and also very, very willing to um, take any questions or indeed comments because I understand that I'm sure many of you have actually been to some of these sites and therefore might want to share some of what you got up to on the wall.